What if there were documents that corroborate the existence of one of the most controversial rumored programs in U.S. history? And what if they were just sitting there where no one thought to look? We're a new channel covering declassified files. Subscribe to join us. In 1991, this article in the LA Times discussed something startling. A secret facility near Papoose Lake, Nevada. It sits just south of Groom Lake in Area 51. According to the story, something called Project Red Light may be operating there, with the goal of duplicating the technology behind flying saucers. This idea came into public consciousness two years earlier, when Bob Lazar appeared on television and detailed his account at a nearby site he called S4 to help reverse engineer one of nine recovered craft. Lazar never mentions Project Red Light by name, but others, some more controversial, have. Bill Cooper wrote in 1991 that Red Light was formed to test fly recovered extraterrestrial craft. He cites documents he viewed, but doesn't share them publicly. In 2013, Stephen Greer's Disclosure Project interviewed a man claiming to be a Bowen technician. He alleged Red Light was real, ongoing, and a reverse engineering program. Is it possible all of these quote-unquote sources are just repeating each other? Do we have any actual proof Project Red Light exists? For years, there was no documented evidence. Until now. Buried in the CIA's archives are a series of obscure contract records signed by the late John Perangoski. Perangoski's obituary in the Washington Post lists him as a CIA agent whose specialty was project management of advanced aircraft and other technology. The contracts confirm this. They're classified under a Project Oxcart. From what has been told to the public, Oxcart oversaw research and development of the Lockheed A-12, the successor to the U-2 spy plane. The designation also encapsulated work on other experimental vehicles. These included codename Kedlock, the Air Force YF-12A, a spy interceptor, and Tagboard, a high-altitude recon drone. What about Red Light? It was never officially disclosed, but is mentioned, mysteriously, in a few miscellaneous places. A contract approved by Perangoski that describes Red Light as a program within Oxcart. The document shows a $1.6 million fuel expense for use in what's described as the area. Other documents, like here, refer to Area 51 as the area. But there are more definitive links. Inside these contracts, we see a half dozen other mentions of Project Red Light. The nature of the spending is not disclosed, they say, for national security reasons. There's something else we came across. This is a once-secret document detailing the crash of a man known as Walter Ray, reportedly the first CIA pilot killed at Grim Lake. Ray was flying a routine test flight of the A-12 on January 5, 1967. He received aerial refueling during the test, but three hours in, something went wrong. He radioed his controller, saying he didn't know where his fuel had gone. And just 10 minutes from touching down, both engines flamed out and he was forced to eject near Caliente, Nevada. Unfortunately, the ejection seat malfunctioned and Ray became trapped in the device, unable to free himself. He and the seat collided with the side of a mountain peak, killing him. CIA search and rescue records show Groom Lake officials took this very seriously. They used air crew from Indian Springs Air Force Base to assist. This crew, mind you, originated from 50 miles south of Area 51 and seemed to not have been previously let in on its classified secrets. That's because in the record, we have something curious. Quote, the crew was given an on-the-spot red light briefing by the deputy security officer and signed a memorandum of understanding. No other mentions of red light are in the crash recovery. But we do know wreckage was returned to Area 51 in the following days, solidifying red light's linkage to the secretive installation. And just for good measure, 
Here's a once top secret memo confirming different Oxcart programs were carried out there. So, what do we know now? Well, red light was real. And it was connected to Groom Lake and Area 51 through Oxcart, the same Oxcart that developed experimental aircraft. But nothing, other than claims from government insiders, connect red light in any way to reverse engineering extraterrestrial craft, at least overtly. There continues to be a question, though, that we can't shake. Do any documents ever disclose an interest in reverse engineering UFOs? You'd be surprised to learn, yes. Discovered in a barn that reportedly belonged to an employee of Douglas Aircraft Company, here is a series of reports that add a lot to this story. Their owner sold them on eBay for $31, and they've since been published online. What they show is remarkable. The company was investigating the phenomenon itself. Their efforts spanned many subjects, including interviews with UFO witnesses and even an account of a test pilot who says his plane was taken inside a spacecraft. The pilot said he had just 10 minutes of fuel left when it happened. He was brought inside the craft for two and a half hours and says he spoke with its commander and top officers. Radar showed a large unknown bogey that merged with the pilot's plane, and he did lose contact with his superior for three hours. When he returned, however, he was discredited and sent to psychiatric counseling. The documents show many other things too, including efforts by scientists to evolve the systems directly from UFO observations. Like here, it is written that the R&D project wanted to design vehicles based on the assumption that UFOs are extraterrestrial and that design clues may be obtained by studying data from these vehicles. The files appear to suggest Douglas may have had actual UFO acceleration and gravitational control data. Study of this, the scientists write, suggested the vehicles may be using strong magnetic fields generated by the craft's propulsion system. This is a key line we'll read in its entirety. Quote, the existence of extraterrestrial vehicles indicates that vehicles can be built, which would have capabilities quite useful to McDonnell Douglas Corporation. In addition, the UFO observations give clues for guiding an R&D program for evolving the vehicles. Remember John Paragoski? Well, here's something very interesting. He was also chief of the Corona Project, which developed the CIA's recon satellites. Douglas Aircraft built some of the booster rockets used for test flights Perangoski oversaw. Interestingly, papers show a decade later, the company was exploring UFO propulsion systems. Their scientists thought that, at least in 1968, the craft relied on gravitational control and amplification. One way to do this, they suspected, was to produce gravitons with high magnetic fields and direct them away from the vehicle. Modern-day scientists still think gravitons, the hypothetical carrier of the gravitational force, likely exist, though we have yet to publicly detect them. There's one other interesting thing we found. A memo shows scientists were discussing the feasibility of a new communications method connected to a UFO propulsion system. They suggested a pilot's internal biological equilibrium system might be able to be linked with a craft to control it. Reading all of this, we can't get a handle on how much real world actual development happened and how much of this stayed theory. But we do know they were interested in the phenomenon. And as a defense contractor for the US military, that's notable. So this was a lot. Let's recap again what we know from these documents. John Perangoski oversaw advanced aircraft operations. Some of this occurred at Area 51 and included a mysterious Project Red Light. Aircrew who went to Groom Lake in the 1960s were briefed on Red Light. At this same time, a contractor with experience developing propulsion systems for other Perangoski projects was studying UFO propulsion systems. The big question, 
Is it possible the advanced aerospace projects carried out at Area 51 went beyond terrestrial spycraft? There's still no smoking gun, though. Maybe these are all just coincidences, and Red Light was just another piece of normal R&D work like the rest of Oxcart. But we found something potentially earth-shattering here that, to our knowledge, hadn't been noticed yet. Sometimes the government makes mistakes, and maybe they did that by releasing those contracts. So what do you think? Is there a connection between Red Light and a reverse engineering program? Or is all of this just one big coincidence? If you enjoy our channel and want to support our production, which takes about one work week per episode, join us on Patreon. It really helps us continue to do this and is as cheap as a cup of coffee each month. Special thanks to current Patreon supporters, including Artem. Without you guys, well, this wouldn't be possible. Another way you can help us is to hit the notification bell and share this with family and friends. This is a topic that deserves much more exposure than it has right now, and you can help us get the story out there.